We're going to move on to talking about waves, and there are a lot of applications of waves. We're going to start by focusing on mechanical waves and simply um, things like a wave on a string. Um, and then we're going to expand this and introduce all, to other, all sorts of other types of waves, like sound waves. And eventually, when you move on in physics, you will learn about electromagnetic waves or light. Um, so we're, we're building, at first, the terminology as it applies to mechanical waves. But this is going to come up over and over and over again in your physics career. So it makes sense. Again, there's going to be a few things in this chapter where I'm going to say, remember this. It's actually worth memorizing. Um, so this is building foundations for some of the later chapters. We're going to start by talking about a transverse versus a longitudinal wave. So a one, so we have uh, a water sur a water wave, for instance. What happens in a water wave is that the same the, the water at a given point moves up and down, but the water is not actually moving left to right. It's not moving forward. So uh, this is called a transverse wave because the wave is moving in one direction and the, the water is moving in another. So in a water wave, the wave travels like this, but the water is going up and down. And when we talk about waves, we quantify uh, the properties of the wave so that the amplitude of the wave is the, uh, is the height of the wave at its maximum distance. So that means if you go from peak to trough, that's twice the amplitude. And the wavelength is the length uh, that it takes for one wave, the, the length, the physical length of one wave. So from peak to peak or from trough to trough. And if you tried to do it in the nodes, which is where the wave hits zero, then um, it, you actually have to have a, one dip and one peak. Um, so however you define it, it's where the, we, the wave circles back on, on itself and you end up at the same point in the cycle. That, that physical distance. We also talk about a wave's speed. That's how high, if you watch one peak of the wave, that's how fast that, um, that peak is moving. So we have transverse and longitudinal waves. Transverse waves are where the displacement is, um, is perpendicular to the velocity. Um, and longitudinal waves are where the displacement is uh, in the direction of the velocity. So um, you, have, you can actually do both with a slinky. If you have a slinky, you, uh, you wiggle the swing, slinky up and down, and you will get a transverse wave. But if you just push it a little bit, you get a longitudinal wave where the displacement is along the direction of travel of the wave. Um, and here you can see what's happening to the slinky in, during the longitudinal wave. So at the beginning, all of the different coils of the sprinky, split slinky are separated by the same distance. You push it a little bit and you compress part of the slinky, and that little zone of compression moves along the wave. Uh, it's a lot, sorry, along the slinky, so that that little um, region where the slinky is compressed keeps traveling. So this is at the, this is initially, this is before the disturbance, this is initially, and then this is showing the progressive time snapshots as, um, as the wave travels along. And then we want to start to quantify what's going on. So here you can see a transverse wave in the, at two different points in time. And there's a few different conventions you can use. But you know, for instance, if you use t equals 0 starting at 0 amplitude at the beginning. So here you can see the wave at the beginning. And then the wave travels. Um, if three seconds later, you see the solid line. Um, and then you can talk about what the properties of that wave are. Um, you have the spatial properties. So you can define the wavelength. That's the wavelength right here from peak to peak. Or you could go from trough to trough or look at how long it takes for one cycle. Um, and then here, uh, if you wanted the speed, you could say, OK, now let's assume if it's traveling in this direction, then it traveled two, uh, so in two seconds, 
uh, sorry, in three seconds it traveled two centimeters. So your speed would be two centimeters for every three seconds. Now that's if it's traveling backwards. You're not actually told if did the wave travel this way or that way. Um, it could do either. Um, so you can read those types of properties of a wave off of the graph. All right, and then we can talk about pulses. This is when you have a short disturbance. Um, so if you have that slinky, instead of regularly pushing it or wiggling it um, so that you get the same pattern throughout, you just do it once. Um, so in a pulse, you have a short disturbance and you, have, you can quantify its wavelength by the length of the disturbance. Um, and you can still talk about the amplitude as, and then the speed um, of the wave as the speed of the pulse as the pulse travels. So here, if you start with a string that is stationary and then you start creating a disturbance at a, a given time, this shows the time as, uh, the, the, this shows the time of, of one period has elapsed so that you have one wave traveling on the string. Um, and then you can quantify it so you've got the displacement of one amplitude. And as you go through time, you start to see the rest of the string um, get displaced as the wave has a chance to travel to that part of the string. We're going to build up the mathematics of talking about waves. Um, so we often are dealing with standing waves, meaning that they have the same pattern repeating over and over. So if we have a wave which is a sine function, um, we use the sine function because it is an oscillation. Um, so it is a periodic function. So when you, it repeats itself every two pi radians, um, that means that it looks like the type of behavior that we have already. Um, you actually have a, an arbitrary choice. Do you start with a sine function or a cosine function? Some books start with a sine function. Your book, or some books start with a cosine. Your book starts with a sine function. So we're going to stick with that notation. And here is a quick cheat sheet of useful equations. These came up uh, a couple of chapters ago as well. So here we have the. We usually use the symbol T to stand for the period. Actually, let me write that on different sides. So here, the T is the period, and F is the frequency. These have to do with how long it takes the wave to travel. Um, and then you have the wavelength. We usually use lambda for that. And this, it, usually it is k. In fact, I don't think I have ever seen a book that does not use k or lambda for the, the um, it uses lambda for the wavelength and k for what we call the wave number. And then omega as before, is the angular frequency. And V is the speed. We don't mean velocity here because this is actually how fast the wave goes. We haven't said anything about the direction that the wave travels. And it turns out that the speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. Using these equations, you can rearrange those two numbers and get that the, uh, get that the, it is also equal to the angular frequency divided by the wave number. There's a bunch of other permutations that you can use um, to describe the, um, to describe the speed. They're basically all different ways of plugging in these definitions and um, describing the same quantities. So you can rearrange it, do basic algebra. Then we put it all together, and we, have, we use 
the displacement. So if you think about a wave on a string, you have um, some displacement as a function of time. And that is the physical displacement along the, in the y direction. For instance, if you're plucking a guitar string, it is the displacement above the center of the string while it's vibrating. Um, and there is a time dependence as well as a spatial dependence for that displacement. And you can describe that uh, displacement like this with uh, some constant indicating the amplitude of the displacement. You have the wave number times the, uh, this should be x, not y. The wave number times the, the length in x um, minus omega t plus phi. This is the, uh, this is the phase shift. And then, um, and then you can put this all together. So when you look at this, the period is the length of the wave in time space. It's how long the wave takes to travel, how long one cycle takes. The wavelength is the physical length of the wave. Um, and so that tells you how, you know, how large the wave is. This phase shift tells you whether it is shifted left to right. Now note in this particular, uh, in this particular notation, the, um, this, you know, I've chosen certain axes, so I've chosen my y-axis to be lined up with the, um, the displacement. This is a transverse wave, so the displacement is perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Um, in this case, the, the wave is moving in the x direction. Um, and then um, this phase shift here, the way that I have drawn this, the phase shift is zero. Um, I could choose, um, I could choose all sorts of, uh, you know, wherever I have the wave, I could have a different phase shift. If I defined my axes to be, my x to be zero anywhere else, I would get a different phase shift. But the properties of the wave would be the same because all that I would be shifting would be the origin of my coordinate system. Now, of course, remember, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. I'm going to put my origin wherever it's easiest to keep it. But sometimes when you're talking about translating an equation like this into what you might observe, for instance, in a lab, you have to remember the basic definition of what it means. And in this case, it means the displacement along the y-axis. So we're going to use these equations over and over. Um, and as we move through the semester, I'm going to assume that you've got this seared into your head because these are some of the definitions that are actually worth memorizing. All right, so here you can take a very specific example. Um, this is showing uh, the height of a wave as a function of, x, of the displacement x. And if we, um, if we look at a certain period of time, so here, let's get the wavelength from the uh, t equals 0 line. So there we can read off that the wavelength is equal to one meter. Um, it tells us that the there's two different times. Um, and we're going to assume that the wave is traveling right. Ah, I didn't mention one thing. When you use this sign convention, it means that the wave is traveling right or to the positive x direction. Okay, so we have the um, wavelength equals one. If we assume it's traveling to the right and that it's only, it hasn't yet completed a full wavelength, if we, it's really easy to pluck out how far that um, the node has traveled because it's easiest to read off the graph where the node is. And the node has traveled point, 
two meters. So we will say the speed is 0.2 meters, and then it's traveled that in 0.8 seconds. So it travels 0.25 meters per second. Then um, we need the wave. We need um, the wave number. The wave number is two pi over lambda. So the wave number is then two pi uh, times inverse meters. The speed is equal to the angular frequency divided by the, um, the wave number, double check, yeah. So uh, then we have the speed, so the angular frequency is the speed times k, so that is one quarter meter per second times two pi inverse meters, and we get that this is pi over 2 inverse seconds. And then we can write an equation for, uh, and here the phase, if we use a sign that at, um, well, let me write out the first part of the equation, y of x and t equals, ah, I didn't read off the amplitude, the amplitude of the wave is 0.2, so I can call that 0.2 meters, ah, and that's not, yeah, that's actually a different 0.2, so A is 0.2 meters, so here I have 0.2 meters times sine kx, 2 pi x minus omega t pi over 2 t. And then here I would have a, I can have a phase angle at t equals 0 and x equals 0. I have the sine of phi. So I see that I can set my phase angle equal to 0 because at t equals zero, the displacement at x equals zero is zero. So my displacement is 0.2 sine 2 pi x minus pi over 2 t. Um, and that's how I would take this graph and write an equation that describes the wave for all time. There will be problems like this that actually comes up sometimes implicitly in the problems. There are a handful of problems where you're explicitly told you just have to write an equation for the wave, and then there's others where to solve the problem you have to write down the equation for the wave. And most of the time when you are solving a problem like this, most of these properties of the wave are going to come up. Wave number, wavelength, angular frequency, period, frequency, some combination of those are going to come up. It's a good idea as you're reading the problem to start writing down what those are so that uh, it's unambiguous. Part of what we're teaching you here, you here as well is how to lay out an answer so that when you're doing your work, for instance, on an exam, it's not just that you get the right answer, but you can show me that you got the right answer for the right reason. Oh, note also, I didn't write the units down up there. Each of the, the wave number and the wavelength have units, but it tends to make the equation very messy to include the units. When I, uh, for my students, I do not always require that they write the units in the equation. When in doubt, at least indicate somewhere that you know what the units are. All right, so here, um, this is showing you how you can read off a period. A period, so here now you have the, uh, the displacement at a given point as a function of time. When you're given some of these graphs, note that it's very important to start by reading the axes of the graph and read what units they have um, to make sure that you're actually answering the question which was asked. The number one problem 
which students have is to answer a question other than the one which was asked. So read the problem carefully. All right, here you can read off the period. The period is the time that it takes for one cycle. Um, it can be easier to read off the, oh, the distance between nodes because it's very easy to see where a node is. You have to be careful if you're using nodes and you're trying to read off the wavelength because you have to go through both a minimum and a maximum. And here you can see that we've got one, two, and then a little bit here and a little bit there, one, two, three, and then about four um, of these boxes, which corresponds to four seconds. And the plot indicates that the period is, in fact, four seconds. All right, now we're going to use this to describe waves on a string. Um, when you have a string um, kept, at, so something like a guitar string, you keep it on, uh, you have some tension in that string, and the, uh, the, the speed of the wave moving along that string, so speed is the square root of the force divided by the angular, the linear density of the string. So the linear density has units of um, kilograms per meter in SI units. Um, and the tension would have units of uh, newtons or kilogram meters per second squared. Um, so then if you multiply them together, you have kilogram squared per, ah, that's Yes, sorry, I don't want to multiply them together. I want to divide them. I want to take the kilogram meters per second squared. This is why you track units, because all of us can lose our minds for brief periods of time. All right, so I have kilogram meters per second squared, and I am dividing by kilograms per meter, and I end up with meters squared per second squared. Then I am going to take the square root of all of that, and I get meters per second. So I indeed get the SI units of a speed. So that tells me what happens to the speed of the wave. When you're talking about a wave moving along a string, that is the speed of the wave in this direction, so along the string. This type of wave is a transverse wave, so the displacement is transverse to the direction of the wave. So you've got the wave moving in this direction, and the displacement is, um, is transverse like that. So, um, so actually, if I'm talking about the displacement, my displacement is constant. Um, but at any given point in the time, I have the, the wave going up and down. OK, so the more tension you have the string under, the higher the speed. The, um, the heavier the string per unit length, the slower the speed. So this is, for instance, why um, when you tighten, if you have, I, I used to play the cello, um, if you tighten the strings, you are increasing the tension, you make the speed of the wave go up. Um, and if you have, if you want the speed of the wave to be lower, then you have the, um, then you want to have a greater mass per unit length. So a thicker string is going to have a slower, in general, if it's the same material, a thicker string is going to have a wave going slower rather than faster. Note that this is the speed of the wave on the string, and we haven't gotten to um, sound waves. So if you're talking about stringed instruments, this is not the speed of the wave when it reaches your ear. This is the speed of the wave on the string. Um, what happens when the string hit, so if you pluck a string um, on a stringed instrument, the frequency on that, uh, of that uh, oscillation on the string itself stays the same when you move into the, air, when the wave moves into the air and creates a pressure wave in the air. So it's the frequency that stays the same. You'll see the speed of sound in the in air is constant. So, it's not quite the same thing as a sound wave yet. We're still talking about the physical displacement of the wave on the string. And 
um, you can, so what happens if you, for instance, pluck the, the string, you end up with, uh, with different um, forces on the string depending on where you are. And it leads to this, this you, you pluck the string, you're actually physically causing the displacement from its initial, from its equilibrium position. And you get somewhat of a restoring force so that anywhere that you are along the string, there is a force which wants to make it go back to being a straight string. So you do this in the lab, for instance, by having a string vibrator that starts wiggling the string here so that you can see um, in, in your lab, you can actually see the displacement along the string. Um, and you, now it won't sound as nice as a stringed instrument, it's the same basic idea though. Um, when you do this, you're actually only exciting one frequency and you will be able to, you, you excite the string and you will see the, the wave move along the string. You can do this with pulses. So you have, um, instead of vibrating the string, you just pluck it and it moves in one direction and then it will reach a boundary. For instance, if you are talking about a stringed instrument where it reaches the point that the string is tied to um, or touches part of the instrument, it reflects. Um, and if you have a fixed boundary, um, when it bounces off the wall, the amplitude of the, um, of the displacement is the opposite sign, um, and if you have a free boundary so that this side can move up or down, then when the wave reflects off of the end, the, it keeps the same sign as the initial displacement. And um, you can have, uh, at any given point in time, you can have both. So if you have, as you pluck, uh, you pluck the string, you have some incident wave, it reflects, and then what you're actually going to have is a combination of both the transmitted wave and the reflected wave. Um, so, in this case, sorry, in this case you're actually changing the density of the strings. So you have a thin string here and you have a thick string here. Um, you're going to get some of the pulse transmitted and continuing to travel on, and then some of it reflects um, and bounces back. Um, and if you have a thick string and then a thin string, you will get some reflection, but again, it doesn't change the sign um, in this case, and then part of the wave gets transmitted and keeps the same sign as the amplitude that you had originally. Um, if you have two pulses that cross each other on a string, their displacements add. This is called interference, and interference is very important. We're going to talk about lots of different phenomena that occur with interference. So if you have two waves, the displacements add. And they can either add so that you end up with, um, so in this case they have the same sign of the amplitude, so when they add you end up with an even larger displacement while they both overlap, and then they travel through each other. And that brings us to interference, which is when you have waves adding together. Um, you can get constructive interference, which is when the displacements in two different waves add up together when they have the same sign. So if you have two waves that are in phase, so here there's a peak here and there's a peak here, um, and you're adding these two waves together, the total displacement is the sum of the displacements. So there's more displacement when in, the, in the total wave. Um, or, and then here it's more displacement in the positive direction here. Both waves are negative here, so you end up with more displacement in the negative direction here. Um, this is called constructive interference because they add together constructively. They both act in the same direction. You can also have destructive interference so that if the two waves are exactly out of phase, this one has a peak where that one has a trough, then um, it's possible that you, well, you can end up with less amplitude in the sum than you had in its two parts, and it can even be perfectly destructive so that there is no wave at the end of it. And when two waves interfere in the same medium, the net um, height is the sum of the individual heights, point by point. So um, you can take, for instance, there's a green line here, 
there's a red line here, you add them together and you get the yellow line, which is the sum of both waves. And this can be any wave. So far we're focusing on waves on a string as an example, but it also applies to um, waves on a pond or, um, or sound or electromagnetic waves or any of the other waves that you might encounter. Those first two cases were when they were nice and neat and the waves were exactly in phase or exactly out of phase but in general and had the same wavelength but you can add together two different waves no matter whether or not they have the same wavelength or frequency they can have different um, they can uh, they don't have to add that to be in phase and then whatever it is you'll you'll get some funky shapes so you can in general see some pretty funky shapes if you look at waves. Um, and this is showing the math of it. So you have the um, you have some initial uh, you have two waves that you're adding together. You add them together. You, th this is how uh, the yellow line always shows the sum, um, and it depends on if you have the two waves in phase. This is so the difference in phase shift is zero. The two wave uh, waves are half a, or, or a quarter of a wavelength out of phase, so they're shifted, but they're not totally shifted. If they are exactly half a wavelength out of phase, the sum is zero, or you can end up with them being something in between that says two-thirds of a wavelength. Um, so whatever it is, you can always add them together, and the sum is the sum of the displacements. And the math is really ugly. You guys probably remember having to do a bunch of stuff where you added sines and cosines. You can work through the math, and if you take, um, if you take for instance, an upper division optics class, you're probably going to have to. Um, so if you have y1 is some amplitude sine, let me just have the positional, um, or let's just do, yeah, if we do position sine kx um, plus phi 1 y2 is a2 sine kx plus phi 2 it's a lot of ugly algebra, but you can use your sine um, addition formulas and write this as one combined wave with, it will have the same, I chose these to have the same wave number, so it's going to have the same wave number, the same wavelength. The, the phase shift will be some combination of these, and um, the amplitude will, uh, could be, um, the amplitude will be some combination of these as well. The math can get a little bit ugly, but it's not intractable. And you know what they say in physics and math classes when the math gets really ugly. They say that this is left as an exercise for the student. That usually means that five pages of algebra later, you'll get an answer. All right, and the interesting part, standing waves. So this is what you actually have if you are plucking a string um, of a guitar, what you will form on that, um, on that guitar string is a standing wave. Um, standing waves uh, happen when, um, when you get something which is it's a form of resonance. You're getting the wave to travel back and forth so that it is at least part of the wave is acting constructively um, when, when you have these reflections at the boundaries so that you always have some displacement. So here you have standing waves on in a bowl of milk sitting on a fan so the bowl of milk has to have that bowl has to have a wavelength the and a wave speed that um, makes it um, when it bounces off of when it travels from the center and bounces off of the edge you end up getting constructive interference between the reflections and the initial wave okay so here if you have uh, so if you have two sine waves and you are adding them together, um, you can you'll get in general some total sine wave. Um, 
And if you are adding up waves, adding up different standing waves, um, you, wherever you have a node, you're going to get a node there as well. OK, so this shows what you actually would see at different time snapshots if you could photograph a guitar string um, after you pluck it. What you're going to see is that there is, at one given time, it's going to form a standing wave like that. Um, at another time, or sorry, at one given point in time, it's going to have a displacement like that. At another time, it's going to have a displacement like that. I'm going to use colors here because I think that the, the monochrome picture here doesn't quite do it justice. Um, you, at each given point in time, you have a sinusoidal function. And your trough at one time is a peak at another time. But you always have the same nodes. So a standing wave, when it travels back and forth, the reflection adds constructively to the incident wave so that they're always, um, they're always adding up together. But they always happen to exactly cancel out um, at the nodes. And we'll talk about what those, um, how you figure out the wavelength from that and what standing waves are actually allowed on a string. So here's how you can do it. You have some, some uh, string vibrator that you can have in the laboratory as standard physics. This is a standard physics lab. You have a string. You change the tension by, uh, by hanging a different mass on the string. Make the approximation that this is a frictionless pulley um, so that you, the pulley is not changing anything, but it's only changing the tension in the string. And then you can. Um, then you can, uh, you can pluck the string. Um, and you can actually use this. Let's see, this has you doing it um, inside a, ah, uh, yeah, this is just on a table. It just looks like a funny table. OK, so then when you get these standing waves, at your boundary conditions, let's think about a guitar string. Your boundary conditions are that at each end of the guitar string where it is affixed to the instrument, the amplitude has to be zero. And the amplitude always has to be zero because you can't move that string up and down where it's fixed. That's what it means to be fixed. OK, now you can come up with any wave, any wave that lets you do that is a standing wave that you can form on that string. So here, that uh, you can have the next highest wave. And that has an additional node in the, in the middle. So because, and, and then that wave, it has twice the wavelength of this wave. So if you put the, the nodes equal to 0 here, this covers half a wavelength. So your wavelength is 2 times L. For the next one, you have one additional um, node. So your wavelength is L. Um, or 2 over, so this first one was 2 over 1 times L. This is 2 over 2 times L. Now you add a node. The wavelength is 2 thirds L. So, or you can write that as 2 over 3 L. You add another node. Now you have, um, now you have three nodes in between the edges of the string, and you have uh, a wavelength of 2 over 2, or 2 over 4 L. So your wavelength is 2 over 4 L. And in general, if you call this, this one is N, we, we, this one is the first one, second, third, fourth. In general, your wavelength is 2 L over N, where N is 1, 2, 3, and so on. So this describes the waves that you can get on a, uh, um, on a string that is um, when you pluck it. If you're talking musical instruments and what the difference between musical instruments is, um, this is the primary note that you hear, um, which the music and physics use different terms, so bear with me. 
Um, this is the fundamental in physics terms. That's the lowest. Um, that's the lowest frequency that you can excite. And then these are the dif the different harmonics. Um, so, uh, so as you go up in um, in as you decrease the wavelength, you go up in the harmonic number. Um, you're decreasing the wavelength. The, an, an actual musical instrument, you're always going to excite this. And when when you pluck a string or if you move a bow across a stringed instrument. Um, you are exciting the different frequencies here, but you're exciting them in different amounts. So what your ear will hear is the pitch is this lowest um, frequency sound, but then um, what, gives the, um, what gives the instrument its characteristic sound, what differentiates a cello from an oboe, well, which is not, let's say a cello from a guitar, is the mixture of different frequencies that you have here. And what differentiates even one cello from another cello, depending on how those different frequencies are excited. But what you hear is the, um, what you hear is the fundamental, and that's what your ear perceives as the pitch. If you look at these waves then on an oscilloscope, and I've done this, um, it's really fun. You may see something that looks a little funky, and it doesn't look like this nice, neat sine wave if you can look at the wave that you're exciting on a stringed instrument, but the wavelength that you can still identify is when the cycle starts to repeat. Now, a key thing that's fun, that's really important, I was about to say fundamental, but I don't want you to use that to mean two things on the same slide, um, is the, the math of this. So I, I, often when you're taking introductory physics, you're learning about these things, and it sounds like you're learning about a very specific case. So, so far, I have told you about, the, we've talked about the nice, neat case when you've got a standing wave on a stringed instrument, but what about other waves? Is this ever applicable? How often are you using this to describe stringed instruments? Well, maybe you use it a lot if you do music and, or if you're a sound technician, something like that. But what's really cool is that there's this thing called a Fourier series. And a Fourier series says that you actually can add up a whole bunch of different sines and cosines. So I can take some arbitrary displacement as a function. Uh, so y is some arbitrary function of x and t. And I can describe that, mathematical caveats, for a sufficiently smooth and well-behaved function that doesn't have any um, discontinuities. I can describe that as sines and cosines. So if I have my fundamental here, I want to, if I have a move, wave moving right by convention, I will, uh, let's just ignore the phase shift there because we're doing boundary conditions. Um, if I have a sufficiently, um, and let's see, I want the N there because I want to get all of the, all of the equations, all of the different wavelengths I can excite. I can come up with some constants, CN, so that I can describe any function that's sufficiently nice and, new to, ne nice and neat and smooth as a sum of the sines and cosines depending on, now here I've, I've used boundary conditions. I could actually define any function if I have sines, but here I've limited myself to the boundary conditions. So fundamentally, if I can write, um, if I can solve the math for sines and cosines, I can actually solve it for all x. Um, all arbitrary functions, which is really cool. Now, you don't need to use that in intro physics, but it may help you slog through the math and understand why it's actually something that's interesting to know. And let's see, this is another variation on the same. I'm just going to, um, oh, 
the adjustable fact, the fact that you can switch, you can change the frequency. So if you, um, this is going to have a fixed, um, this is going to have a fixed wave speed. So your wave speed is always going to be the frequency, the, the, sorry, the force on the string divided by, the, the square root of the force on the string divided by the um, linear mass density of the string. That fixes the force. The, um, this has got to be equal to the um, frequency of the wave divided by the wave number. Okay, this is 2 pi f, and this is 2 pi over lambda. So I can also, well, which is the other form of this equation, so I can just say that it is the frequency times the wavelength. So this string vibrator operates at a certain frequency. It wiggles the string a certain number of times per second. That is a physical property of a given um, string vibrator. In the physics lab, the, the standard intro physics lab, this frequency is tunable, which means that you can change it. Your speed, once you've fixed attention, your speed is not tunable. You can tweak it a little bit, but it's a little harder to change. Here, you've fixed your wavelength. So, or you know that, sorry, you haven't necessarily fixed the wavelength. The fact that this is fixed and that's fixed means that there's a certain wavelength of wave that is generated. But if you generate a wavelength, if you choose your frequency so that it is one of those standing waves, so your wavelength, instead of just being some arbitrary wavelength, is 2L over um, 2L over N, where N is equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on, this is going to tell you that you have certain frequencies where you will excite those standing waves. So those frequencies are going to be the speed, or let me just leave this as the square root of the tension in the string divided by the linear mass density times n over 2f. Okay, so then there's going to be fixed frequencies. Let's say that your uh, the first frequency that you can excite is, um, I don't want my f there, the first frequency that you can excite it could be, uh, I wanted to have my L, that should have been an L. If my first frequency is 440 hertz, then um, my next frequency is going, to be, uh, is going to be twice that, it's going to be 880 hertz. My next frequency is going to be three times that. It is going to be 1320 hertz. So, and, and so on and so on. So there's going to be certain um, frequencies where um, I get a standing wave. So if I have my string vibrator set at just the right frequency, it's going to start oscillating. And in the lab, you'll even be able to see this. You can see the physical displacement of the string um, so that you can see the standing wave on it. And actually, if you're a musician, Go ahead and try to do this. Um, it, it's a little easier. Well, you can do it um, two ways. You can pluck the string. That can be a little harder to see. And you have to pluck it really hard to be able to, to see that you've actually got the standing waves on the string. Also, if you take a very large string, so if you have a double bass and you pluck that string, um, large displacement so that the displacements you start off with are large as well, then you can actually see the standing wave on the string. All right, so, um, yeah, this is just showing, so your boundary conditions are that at the ends of the string, when you have a wave on a string, the ends of the string are fixed, so you can have this standing wave, but you can't have this standing wave. And here you see for a particular wave, so here you have a string, which is 
two meters long. And if you excite the, so the, low, the largest wavelength that you can get has then a wavelength of four meters. The next, the next large, small, the next one down, it is, um, has a wavelength half that. You fit one wave in the, a whole cycle in the wave. That's two meters. The next one down, you fit one and a half wavelengths in. So your wavelength is 1.33 meters. If you forget the equations, so, you know, physicists will rederive three pages of algebra to avoid memorizing a simple equation. If you forget the equations, as at least I personally want to do, um, you can go ahead and draw pictures like this and rederive the equation fairly quickly. Um, and here you can have, so if you have different boundary conditions, so we've talked about a wave on a string, you can do the same thing with a metal rod. You're less likely to be able to see the visual um, displacement if you have a metal rod because it's much more rigid. The displacements are a lot smaller in the y direction, but, um, but you at least, um, the, the physics in the, is the same, the math is the same. Um, you will get the same thing. You got fixed boundary conditions. Um, if you have um, something where you have the rod fixed elsewhere, not at the ends, this is where you have fixed your, uh, your nodes. Um, and then if you want to get, um, if you want to get resonance, then you ha need to have an anti-node out here. It's, for, it's uh, allowed to vibrate because the rod will in fact vibrate. If it, if it doesn't have an anti-node here, when you, when the wave reaches, uh, the wave can travel past this and when it reaches the end, it's going to reflect and it will interfere destructively. So here you want to have um, an anti-node and that will fix what wavelengths you can have um, and to get a standing wave. Now we've talked about exciting this with a, um, with a physical vibrator, but it's any other way of exciting the frequency, um, of exciting the oscillation, you're getting this thing physically shaking. So it could also be um, people walking past on a bridge, um, just about anything. When you have one of these problems where you're looking at mechanical waves, one of the first questions you want to ask is, what are my boundary conditions? Because whatever your boundary conditions are, that is going to set what, um, that's going to set what the math is. Okay, and then here, this is, watch how you're measuring wavelength. Wavelength can be between either two peaks, peak to peak, trough to trough, or somewhere in between but it has to be where you've gone through one entire cycle. And it's not uncommon to watch students doing this in the laboratory and they don't quite get, you know, they might go, oh, well, this is the wavelength. Don't forget to go one full cycle. Honestly, I've been doing this for years. I know intellectually what it's supposed to be, but sometimes I make that my mistake myself. All right, now we're gonna move on to some examples. Here are three waves sent down a string at different times. The tension in the string remains constant. What is the, um, what is the smallest, smallest wavelength to the largest wavelength? The smallest wavelength, I'm gonna do A, the smallest wavelength is C. C has the smallest wavelength followed by B, Actually, if we want to be really careful, let's just do this. Let's write the wavelength out. I don't necessarily trust myself. The wavelength for A is three units, or sorry, is six units. One, two, three, four, five, six. So six, let's make up, um, I love making up units. If you, have, you can't just have a wavelength of six, you have, a, have to have a wavelength of six somethings. We will make it six water bottles. So pretend that that axis is telling you, you got some, I can use anything as a distance measure. So six water bottles. 
when I had to explain to my young children how far away they had to stay from people um, during the pandemic, and they didn't know what, say, a meter or a foot was, the unit we'd used was one daddy. They had to stay one daddy away from, um, from other people. I love making up my own units. All right, so then we do B. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. B has a wavelength of eight water bottles. C has a unit wavelength of one, two, three, four. Okay, so then when we are asked to rank them from smallest wavelength to highest wavelength, it is C, and this is why I liked, I wanted to write it down because my eye and my brain were not working correctly together. A is the next smallest, follow C, A, and then B. Um, so this has the smallest. The speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency, or the frequency is equal to the speed divided by the wavelength. So the frequency is related to the inverse of the wavelength. That means the smallest wavelength is going to have the highest frequency. So if I am asked to go from the lowest frequency to the highest frequency, I switch the order. B has the longest wavelength, therefore it has the highest frequency. C has the smallest wavelength, therefore it has the lowest frequency. Uh, so uh, therefore it has the highest frequency. So they're flipped. You can um, add to this. Uh, that's, that's a nice qualitative question. Do you understand the difference between wavelength and frequency? Do you understand what a wavelength is? Can you read a graph? If I talk about a displacement, um, do, you, do you know what we mean when we're talking about waves? At the same time, if you get the concepts, it's not, it's not a particularly onerous problem. Okay, so yeah, we've talked about mechanical waves, but you can have other waves. If you talk, when you get to an electronics lab, most um, physics programs have an electronics class, including ours, and you will often use um, wave generators. And one of the waves that you can generate is called a square wave. You can add up a bunch of, it looks approximately sort of like this, it'll have some pulse and it's got sharp-ish edges. There's actually imperfections, so it's usually not exactly sharp. But you can come up with, um, you can come up with some arbitrary shapes. Um, and then this question is, what is, if you add these two together, what is the total? So I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna draw it on top of this. So we go to two and a half, and both waves are zero at two and a half or sorry, at three, until you, both waves are zero until you hit three. And then you hit uh, three, and this one has a displacement of two, this one has a displacement of two. So you go up here, and the until you get to five, so both have the same displacement until you get to five. forgive my bad artistry, then this wave adds one. So you go up to, so here this is four. You go up one, you get a displacement of five until here when this one keeps its displacement of three, and this one goes down to a displacement of negative one. So the sum goes down to two. And then I have, my wave has a height of two until I get here. Now I have negative two plus negative one is negative three. for one unit, and then both waves go to zero. So the way that I would recommend doing this is that you um, 
just add up the heights at each individual point, and that's your, your sum. I chose to put it on the same graph as one of the others because that way I don't have to do as much drawing. Drawing is not really my thing. And a good physicist is a lazy physicist. All right, two strings are attached between two poles separated by a distance of two meters as shown above. Both have the same tension or have the same tension of 600 newtons. String one has a linear density of here when I copy and paste it is um, it loses the equations. So they have different linear densities. Um, and they are they have so they have different linear densities, which means that they have different speeds. And it asks how much time passes before the waves pass one another. Okay, so for wave one, we have speed one, which is they have the same tension and different, um, different linear densities. So they have different speeds. And then this asks how much time passes before the pulses pass each other. So um, you can do this in different ways, but the way that I'm gonna do it is to describe the position of wave one. I'm gonna use a coordinate system where I will say that the pulse is in the X direction and the height of the, and the displacement of the, or, or the wave front um, has a, for the first one, has a displacement of the, of the velocity times time. So it's velocity times time. The second one has a displacement of its velocity times time, or sorry, it will start at the other direction. So it's gonna have a velocity, it's gonna have a position of the length. It's traveling in the opposite direction. So the second velocity times time. Here's where I think we get to a class of physics problems where I've given you equations that apply to a certain type of problem, but then I'm not even using it. What I'm using here is logic. Physics problems are often just overall word problems. You have to take what you're given and write it down as an equation. And you can't necessarily flip through the book until you find the equation that describes your problem. You could try describing pulses and waves. It's a lot more complicated. Here I'm just gonna mathematically talk about it as a, just a displacement moving horizontally because I don't actually have to worry about anything we learned in this chapter. If I read this problem correctly, I only need to write equations for the displacement as a function of time. And they will pass each other when x1 equals x2. So when v1t equals the length minus v2t. So I can write this as v1 plus v2t equals l. And the length, so I get that the time has to equal the length divided by the sum of the velocities. And I could calculate the velocities like this. If I wanted to get really fancy, so this is length over the square root of F divided by the square root of U1 plus the square root of F divided by the square root of u2 and this is l over the square root of f times 1 over 1 over the square root of mu1 plus 1 over the square root of mu2 and ugly algebra going to multiply by the square root of 
m1 times m2, and I get mu1, mu2, this ugly equation. Is that simpler? I don't know that it is. It's different. So this type of problem is taking, you know, there was a little bit we used. The only part that we used out of this chapter was that we know what the, um, we know what the speed of a wave is given its velocity and, um, and then we can use logic to figure out what the, um, to figure out when the two waves actually hit the same position. All right, so while I'm erasing that, um, two transverse waves travel through a taut string. The speed of each wave is, you have, the, the speed of each wave is the same. Um, and they're both passing through at the same time. What is the wavelength of each wave? What is the frequency of each wave? And uh, let's see. What is the maximum? Okay, they're two different. They're t the same. The string has the same properties for each wave, but it's a different wave. Okay. And now you can, this is a reading a graph problem. So A, what is the wavelength? All right. So in the first case, I'm going to go from trough to trough because that's easy to read off. So Y2 lambda is 6 meters. Y1 or sorry, yeah, that was sorry, that was y2. Y1, it is 10 meters. B. What is the frequency of each wave? So here I didn't copy the speed, so let's make up a speed. We will choose a nice round number. Let's say V equals one meter per second. That's a nice even number. So what is the frequency of each wave? The speed equals the wavelength times the frequency. So the frequency equals the speed over the wavelength. So for the first case, y1, the speed, let me just put a subscript one and two there. The speed of the first wave, if I go with one meters per second, Sorry, the frequency of the first wave is one meter per second divided by 10 meters, which is 0.1 inverse seconds. And inverse seconds are also called hertz. For the second one, the frequency is one over one sixth. One over one sixth, so one sixth. And then it asks for what is the maximum vertical speed of each wave? That's a good question as well. So here, um, I didn't write my equations down. I'm sure that it was somewhere in the book, but remember that a physicist would rather do five pages of algebra rather than memorize one simple equation. So we had the form y as a function of x and t is a cosine omega t, or sorry, I got to have a wave moving to the right, kx minus omega t plus phi. I don't have to have a wave moving to the right, but by convention, we usually have a wave moving to the right. Now, the vertical speed is the derivative of y with respect to t. Many of you guys are taking calculus right now. If you are, my apologies. Well, you probably have reached where you can do this type of derivative already. So even if you're in calculus concurrently, you should be able to handle this. And my derivative is negative a omega, the cos, 
uh, then I have a sine kx minus omega t plus phi. And then because it is a, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, I get a positive there. Then the magnitude of the, so the maximum vertical speed is going to be a, the amplitude times omega. Okay, now what I've directly read off of this graph is lambda. So I'm going to write, uh, so I now need the amplitude of each wave. The amplitude of the first wave is 3 meters. The amplitude of the second wave is 2 meters. And my omega, I have omega equals 2 pi f. And that's probably going to be my easiest form. Um, and I need, so in the case of the vertical speed for the first wave, this is a 1 omega 1, or 2 pi a 1 omega 1. And then that is 2 pi times 3 meters. Ah, ah, and actually, sorry, this should be an F when I did this. 2 pi times 3 meters times F1, which is 1 tenth. So I'm going to approximate this. Pi is about 3. 3 pi is approximately 10. So I have about 20 divided by 10, so this is approximately 2. And then here, this should have been units of seconds, so I have about 2 meters per second. For the second one, I have that the vertical speed is 2 pi a 2 f 2, and that is equal to... 2 pi times 2 meters times 1 sixth. Here again, I'm going to approximate pi is 3. So 2 pi divided by 6 is about 1. And here I have also about 2 meters per second. Now I'm sure that if I actually plugged in the exact numbers in there, I'm going to get something that is ever so slightly different from 2 meters per second in both cases. Um, but maybe it's going to be different in the same way because I, in both cases, I rounded pi to three. So I think I'm going to get the same answer. And that would show that you can actually get the same speed, um, even if the same, at least vertical speed through different combinations of displacements. And what I want to point out here, this is where reading the problem really matters. So you've you do a lot when you're working with waves talking about the wave speed. It's very easy to read this problem quickly and miss that it's actually talking about, it's asking you for the vertical speed and not the, um, not the speed of the wave itself. And again, the number one problem, the number one mistake that students make in physics problems is that they read the problem incorrectly. All right, so here you have setup that we talked about a lot. You have an experimental setup shown above where you've got a string, the string vibrator, you have a pulley, um, ma roughly massless pulley, you have a length of one meter, um, and again, I didn't copy the exact linear density, um, and then what are the wavelength and frequency of the, the n equals six mode? Okay, so here what we need to have is, first of all, the wavelengths we're allowed to have. It's help, helpful to write that down. The wavelengths are 2 times the length divided by n, where n equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. Then um, we need to have 
asking for the wavelength and the frequency. So the frequency is equal to the speed divided by the wavelength, or in this case, the speed. We then want to use the square root of the force over the mass density. So you have one over the wavelength times the square root of the force times the mass density. And um, then uh, here we will do, go ahead and do A. So the wavelength is going to be for n equals 6, 2 meters, so 2 times 1 meter divided by 6 is 1 third of a meter. What is the frequency? All right, so the frequency, let us choose... We're going to choose the, I'm going to make up a linear density, let's say 100 grams per meter, so 0.1 kilograms per meter, we'll call that our mu, and let's say that the mass is 1 kilogram. So that our force, it, which is mg, the tension in the string is mg. Note that you know the tension is the string, that the tension of the string is mg, because this is a massless pulley. The, the string merely redirects the force. It doesn't, it, or this, it does not actually create a force. We're approximating, well, it's maybe not the best approximation to say that the string is massless, but it's not too bad. Good enough for, for this. So we will say that that's, so one kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared is 9.8 newtons. Ooh, I'm not sure I can do a square root in my head. Um, so then we have the frequency is one over one third meter divided by, oh, actually this one I think I will be able to. Here I have 9.8 newtons divided by 0.1 kilograms per meter. And then this is roughly 9.8 times 100. So that's roughly, or sorry, 9.8 times 10, that's roughly 100. The square root of 100 is 10, so I end up with 30 because I'm dividing here by one third. Let me watch my units. I have kilogram meters per second squared divided by kilograms per meter. So my units and the square root of all of that and here I have meters, uh, ah, I have inverse meters, one over meters. So I have one over meters times meters per second or uh, hertz. So my frequency is 30 hertz. Then it says the air, the string oscillates the air around the string. If the speed of sound is 330 meters per second, what is, the, um, what is the wavelength of that sound? So this is lambda f. So I now have the frequency. The frequency stays the same. So the wavelength, and this is a very, as, as a sound, that'd be a very low frequency sound. Um, the, the wavelength is going to be 330 meters per second divided by 30 hertz. And that's going to be 
uh, 11 meters. So that wavelength has, that has a wavelength of 11 meters. All right. So another one, while I erase the, the previous problem, you have a rod that is mounted to a support in the center. A node has to exist where the rod um, is mounted, um, and then draw the first normal modes of the rod as it's driven into resonance. So I like this problem because um, you weren't given an equation for this. You're asked to use what you know to figure out what equation describes this. So if you know that there's a node, so now you know there's a node at the center. At the ends, you have to have an anti-node now in order to have the, um, in order to have this reflect. Okay, uh, it says draw the first two wavelengths. So here I have to have something that has an anti-node um, at both places. So this is my lowest wavelength. I'm going to show it going the other way because it makes a nice pretty picture. When we talk about pipes, you have, we'll draw pictures that look the same. So I have to have something which has anti-nodes in the same place. Now I'm going from peak to trough. So that's half a wavelength. So my wavelength is twice the length of the rod. The next one that I can excite, I still have to have an anti-node here. Um, and I have to end up with a node here. But I can go through one, and I can go through two-thirds of a cycle to get back to that. OK. Ooh, this one's a little harder to draw. Bear with me. I am not an artist. OK, so then I can fit one and a half wavelengths into this. So my wavelength is two thirds times the length. All right, I got to add one more. Ooh, I, I think my drawing abilities are limited there. If I had to add another, so my next highest would wave, my next highest um, freak or wavelength would be the, um, I'd squish one more wavelength into that. So then I would have for the next one uh, two and a half, let me write it. So I'd have 2.5 wavelengths in one length, or wavelength equals, uh, so this is 5 over 2, so this is 2 over 5. So I have. 2 over 1, 2 over 3, 2 over 5, and my wavelength is going to be given by 2 over uh, 2n plus 1 times the wavelength, where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on. So what's nice about this problem I like, I, what I like about this problem is that first of all, you have to actually draw the nodes. So if I'm asking this question, I'm asking you to show me that you understand what the math means, not just that you can do some basic algebra, because let's face it, this is not a complicated equation. But you have to show me that you know what the equation means, and you have to show that you know where those nodes come from. So it's not like, you don't just have to derive the, you don't just have to use the equation for the a wave on a string. You have to show me that you know where those nodes come from and why the answer is as it is, because you're taking that 
with knowledge about where the nodes are, and you're applying it to derive the appropriate equation for a different class of problems entirely. So that's a beautiful problem. Okay, here you have a wave that model a wave function uh, that models a wave as a function as a function of time, um, and basically this problem says describe the math for everything for this wave. All right. So first of all, and here I'm going to um, assume that it's only traveled this far, not that it's traveled even further. All right. The amplitude is, let me try a different marker. The amplitude is 0.3. Note here, and this is in meters, note that the way that this is drawn, this is assuming that the amplitude, um, that well, this is assuming the wave is about y equals zero. If you were looking at this, for instance, on an oscilloscope in the lab, it's not guaranteed that this is centered at zero. You have to be really careful. So if you're talking about, say, reading something off of an oscilloscope, it's easier to calculate the amplitude by going from peak to peak than to, uh, to just measure the height of a peak, you know, not than to go from the center to a peak. All right, so the amplitude is 0.3. Um, I can read off the wavelength it's going to be easier to go from node to node. So my wavelength, I need to go through one full cycle. I'm being very careful. I need, you know, I need to go past one, two nodes if I'm using the nodes. And then here I have one, two, three, four, and then almost five, which I pick up the rest of it over here. So I'm going to say five units five units on in this um, in this coordinate system and with these um, with these tick marks that's going to be one so my wavelength is one meter I can tell that it's meters because that's denoted here on the axis but note that it isn't necessarily you should always read the axes just in case all right then we have um, Then we have things like we need to know so that we need to know the speed in order to get the equation for all time we need to know the speed so let's look at how far if we we know that in 2 seconds the wave traveled let's see this is t equals 0 and this is t equals 2 so this traveled 1 2 we'll say three units, so 0.6 meters in two seconds, or 0.3 meters per second. All right. Then we want to get the, um, the frequency, and the frequency is going to, oh, we actually want to write the equation, well, we could write it in terms of frequency. So let's, let's get the frequency. The frequency is equal, the speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So the frequency is equal to the wavelength divided by the speed. This is one meter divided by point meters per second um, and that is so three tenths ten thirds or 3.33 Hertz all right then the phase shift, well, let's, ooh, I'm not getting, the phase shift is really hard to get when you're reading this off of plot. Let's see. 
at the beginning. Oh boy, I don't know if I can get that one. Let's, uh, if we use the form, I'm not sure I can get that without a calculator. Y of X and T is A, stick with the books notation, sine of omega of KX minus omega T plus phi, And then y of 0, 0, we will call point two, three. And that is equal to the amplitude uh, times sine of phi. So phi is equal to the inverse sine of 0.23 divided by 0.3. I am not doing that in my head. Um, all right, and then we can put it all together and write y of x and t is equal to 0.3 meters sine of 2 pi over lambda x minus omega, which is 2 times f, or sorry, 2 pi times 2 pi f times time, I'm going to wrap this over here, plus our phase angle. Okay, so that tells me the displacement for all time for this particular wave. This is another good problem. Um, I like to have, when I'm writing exams, I like to have a problem which asks you, you're given part, of either a picture or some of the information, and you're asked to describe the position of the wave for all time. So you have to show that you know the relationship between the wave length and the frequency and the speed. Um, I like to have one problem where you just have to write out all of these quantities for one wave. Show me that you know how everything relates to everything else. If you get the, the, the concept, that's not such a hard problem. But if you don't, then, then even if you can do some of the harder problems correctly, I'm not sure you really understand it. Okay, so there's... This is, of course, also the foundation for some of the later chapters, um, and when we talk about um, more advanced concepts and interference. So make sure that you master these concepts. And I would also, if you're keeping an equation sheet with the things that you need to use all the time, we've run into the basic definitions for all of for wavelength, speed, period, angular frequency, frequency. Have those relationships at your fingertips. All right, and with that, we're going to end this chapter, and I'll see you for the next one.